That's it. Next event. No buffet. <laughs> Hello. I'm Lux, and I'm stealing all of Glomgold's lines. Because no one steals anything from him. Uh, and I'm Ember, and I got nothing. <laughs> and this is our thoughts on Disney's new DuckTales. Season 1, episodes 14 and 15. Jaws with a dollar sign, and The Golden Lagoon of White Agony Plains, a.k.a. just in case you were missing soap operas. <laughs> Though I must say this is like the funnest soap opera I've ever watched, and I've only watched a couple. Amber's probably watched more than I have, thanks to just being within the same household as someone who watched them all the time. All My Children, One Life to Live, GH. And then there's me who only knows about the tropes thanks to the internet. And the one time, a, apparently, what was it, a New Year's party that lasted for an entire season? Mm-hmm. A New Year's party. One day. What is this, 24? <laughs> ah, but let's start with the first episode. Jaws. Still with the dollar sign. Ah, we get to see Lena again, which is always nice because she's a fun character. I also liked how her magic kind of changed color things to Webby. That's kind of an interesting fact to know for the future. And... There were a lot of, like, as the name implies, jaw references. The way Launchpad was acting at one point. The fact that Dewey and Louie got yanked off the boat the way they did. Which I think almost happened, actually, in the movie. Though no one actually said the line, We're gonna need a bigger boat. There was opportunity for it, because the shark was growing in size. But they had a hard enough time getting their hands on the first boat resulting in outright theft. So first we have breaking and entering, and then we have theft. And we have Scrooge having to deal with a reporter who's, whoa, dang, she is fast. And she wasn't quite that negative in the pilot towards him, because... Well, I think it worked better for her at that particular moment to be like she was. This time it was like, railroad him into a corner. Also, since now it's been since the pilot that he's been actively treasure hunting again, mm. this could be a change in things. That's a really valid point. I was like, I pay for it? <laughs> that's, a, that's another thing I see. Is he's, he, if, if he gets treasure and it's in that game for him, he's okay with paying for repairs. I guess that's why he keeps Launchpad around. Because yeah, he's okay with paying for his repairs. I'm still really sure that all of Launchpad's repairs come straight out of his salary, so he never has to pay Launchpad. Because, I mean, come on, the guy can't be pulling much, because remember, it was ketchup stain or mustard stain for his shirt. Though, Scrooge said he was going to dock his pay. He was going to dock him a day's pay. Just like how in the pilot he said every dent is coming out of your salary. If it nets to zero... If it gets overdrawn, Launchpad would have to pay to work for Scrooge. I also liked how everyone was like, hi! <laughs> they ended up inside the shark. Yes, every time someone gets swallowed by the shark, it's basically, hi. Yeah, because it's like, how much like a shark is this creature actually? Because is there a digestive tract? Is, obviously it's hollow, because it's easier to get larger if you don't focus on filling up a solid mass. But there's not going to be, like, a digestive tract or anything. It's a magical MacGuffin that eats coins. Also, how can you possibly use a bag of coins as bait when it's swimming in coins? Yeah, what, what does it have to do to gain mass? Because apparently that's what they were waiting for, for it to gain enough mass to be able to hunt down Scrooge. Well, it was basically sorting through all the treasure to find the dime. But the dime wasn't there. Because Scrooge is smarter than that. I still want to find out what's so important about his dime. What's magical about it. Because that's like probably the one magical thing he has. Also, I love how they, in the next episode, they keep finding out how old Scrooge is. But back to this episode, it was just the dime thing, kind of. Got me. Maybe it's just like how old and how long it's been next to him. That's actually absorbed all of... His awesomeness. Because we have the story of how he got it. There's nothing particularly magical there beyond the magic of hard work, which any part of his treasure could fall under. So 
Because it's never really explained in the other cartoon series. You know, what's so important about number one dime? Also, Magica doesn't have an accent this time. At least not the thick one she had in the original series. I was going to say, they didn't do that whole, you know, spell casting backwards type thing. She sounds very modern. Very. And now I'm wondering more about Lena's past. And how Lena came to be trapped. And how is wanting your freedom a deepest, darkest secret? I'm thinking she's only trapped by the way she thinks. Like, she thinks she betrayed someone. Or uh, it's something like that. It's actually an innocent thing, but she was tricked into thinking it was a bad thing. So she's trapped by that. Or she's cursed in some way, and she found out about magic under the spell, and is going to use that to get rid of the curse, or something like that. Or she blames herself for whatever happened to her family. Random theories, ho! Because Lena keeps saying, yeah, but every time we use magic, bad stuff happens. Because... She kept trying to push Webby away from magic, even the spell that was going to save them from the shark, because it was activating, because Lena's aura was changing. What's really interesting is she lit up, Webby didn't. Probably because Webby has no innate magical ability, but because they were connected. And like I pointed out before, the color change, because one was Magicka's energy and the other was Webby's energy. Also, apparently, friendship bracelets. Oh, she even called them magical friendship bracelets. I wonder if they were actually magical, like she made them based on something she read in that book. Entirely possible. Also, how is Lena going to explain the bracelet being missing? I mean, it was a good symbolic thing of her taking it off and letting it drown in the water. But as soon as she put it in the water, I'm like, um, the current from there, it's going to end up where Webby is, and Webby's going to find it, and she's going to come out there and think that something really bad happened to you. We'll see. Well, let's see. It's going to be interesting because that's another question that popped into my head. It's like, next time Lena sees Webby, bracelet? Well, Lena has long sleeves, so the bracelet doesn't show. Also, the entirety of everything that went on with the money shark, I'm pretty sure she can legitimately say she lost it in the scuffle. Yeah, especially the very end is where she probably would have said, yeah, it was lost then. There's always so much in these episodes. And also, was Magicka's Jewel destroyed or was the curse nullified? I'm thinking it was like nullified or something because I think that jewel we see Scrooge pick up. Wrong color. I think it was changed by the spell. So I think it got changed blue after the whole thing. Also, poor Scrooge. I think he lost, what, one quarter of a one quarter of one quarter of one quarter of a percent? So about one sixteenth because you have to remember that the money bin is only coins, jewels, and artifacts. It's not stocks, it's not bonds, it's not any electronic deposits or balances. You know that the monthly lease payment from the city of Duckburg isn't going in the money bin, it's going in his bank account. Which is another interesting fact we didn't bring up last couple episodes, the fact that apparently Scrooge owns the land Duckburg is built on, and the city has to pay him to exist there. The real question is, what will happen if Scrooge ever had to repossess? What about all the people who are living there? What would Scrooge... The logistics alone would cost him more money than just leave him alone. Also, no matter how much we think of it, Scrooge actually has a kind heart, so I don't think he would be cold-hearted enough to go, yeah, y'all are leaving now because the city couldn't pay. Because if he displaced all the townsfolk... Okay, one, he wouldn't have access to the goods and services that he needs handy. Two, that's a few thousand more people who want him dead. Though, you know, he doesn't seem to worry too much about that. He's like, yes, if I had a dime for every death curse that I had on me, I'd be a heck of a lot richer. <laughs> ah, Scrooge. Also, he can't be that against... Magic, I think he's against using it, but he has plenty of magical things. Go back to the pilot and all the stuff that was in the garage. The Deus Excalibur and the gong and the spirit of Blackbird the pirate, etc. I think he's against using it as a shortcut because that's what he said to Webby apparently. A shortcut to hard work, but magic, depending on how the discipline is presented in a story, can be just as much, if not more, work. Hmm. Maybe that's how he got into a disagreement with Magicka's spell. 
Probably, because the Dispels family thing is magic. What else would you like to go over about this episode? Could you understand what Donald said? I don't know, and I think that's what Lena was also going, Ah! Uh. Oh, that's definitely what Lena was doing, but I was like, Donald hasn't had much screen time the past few episodes. Is this like back in the pilot where I wasn't used to listening to him? Also, I love how they're all struggling with that giant coin. And Beakley just comes over one-handed, picks up the coin, and all of them. And also going back to the in intelligibility of Donald, makes you want to go back and watch it with subtitles on. <laughs> just to see if they put anything there or if they just put gibberish. <laughs> or just Donald speaks. Oh, thank you. You're so helpful. <laughs> but yeah, that was a great moment. Lift. Kunk. <laughs> Dang, she is a strong woman. So I'm still trying to figure out moving forward to the next episode now. How did Goldie take out Beakley and Webby? She's Goldie, apparently. Kind of like, you're Scrooge McDuck. That can't be the answer to everything. <laughs> but apparently it was. Kind of like, I'm Batman. Answer to everything. But if you get the other one stuck in my head. Yeah, nope. You're Scrooge McDuck. <laughs> you're going to stop that cave-in. Because I'm Scrooge McDuck. It was not a cave-in. <laughs> no, no, it wasn't. And also, nice, bear taming, and you also woke the bear up, Scrooge. Why didn't you get yelled at? He probably talked with the bear beforehand. Well, yeah, they would have had to have a nice long conversation in order to do this whole thing of, you know, taking out Goldie, tying her up, tying her to the bear, leading the bear on a rope. Yeah, like I was mentioning before in the previous part, how old is Scrooge? We know both of them, by the way, they're talking is pretty old, at least somewhere in the hundreds at this point. And they just told us now that they spent five years in that ice. So that counts towards your age in terms of the number of years that have passed. But since you were frozen in ice, does that really count towards your chronological age? Because ice is preserving. Also, I think they did mention how a little bit, at least. Apparently Goldie's been at the Fountain of Youth, and Scrooge apparently has experienced something else similar. Goldie hit the Fountain of Youth, and then uh, Scrooge was talking something about a uh, demon dimension. And I love the banter back and forth between the two of them. It was great. Like, I did this. Oh, I caused that. I must have just missed you. <laughs> I had this amulet plot device. You know, plot device. I completely forgot about it by the end, though, until you were like, Oh, the amulet! I'm like, oh yeah, fireproof. <laughs> yeah, yeah, no, trust me, they didn't just kill her on air. But even Scrooge temporarily forgot about the amulet. <sighs> and the way the voice actor was playing Scrooge was fabulous. Just the, oh, she's so awesome. <laughs> I love her because she's so evil, it's great. <laughs> I love her because she loves money more than me. But I hate her because she loves money more than me. Also, she left me to die. But she knew he was Scrooge, so it would be fine. And that's what ticked him off. Like, you could have freed me. Dang it. Just the fight scene between them and, oh my god, just their interactions made this episode so good. And also, Scrooge stocking up at the buffet. Because Glomgold paid for it, so why not? Yeah. Arch enemy. If you can swindle something out of them. Go right in, even if it's just free food. He's your arch nemesis. Why not? <laughs> I mean, considering all the times he's tried to blow you up, including on television live. Oh, this is embarrassing. <laughs> so I can't believe he was willing to do that on air. Though apparently he and the reporter get along, so she probably would have done a great job spinning it. Hmm. Though that also... His plans always seem to fail because of something like, if I put on this... Gold will burn you alive. It will be great. Pull, pull, pull. Don't tell me this malfunction to get. Oh, okay. She's alive? I actually expected her to be like hiding in such a way that you see that she's basically naked because her clothes are burned off, but she was fine. But it kind of makes sense. Like, like whatever she's wearing also is protected. Because, you know, it's a kid show. Kind of like Superman. There's like... A layer of invulnerability just a couple millimeters out from his body. Because the suit usually doesn't take battle damage, but it's just store-bought fabric. 
And then there's Peter Parker. Poor boy. I wonder how often he has to, has to buy new super suits. Because his outfits get shredded. Uh, just reminds me of a quick thing in the movie. The fact that we're like, no, cut out a little bit more. No, how about a little bit more? Ah, a little bit more. <laughs> and they were at one point they were like, you know, the structural integrity of the suit can't last much more of this. <laughs> one more cut. And now back to the regularly scheduled episode. And Glomgold and Dewey is just... <laughs> That's worse than me, boy! Sorry, can't do it. Uh, anything else you'd like to go over about these fabulous episodes? Yeah, so how hot is Molten Gold that it's not melting the tubing that it was being piped through and not melting the ship? Also, what's keeping it molten? Hmm. Good question. Though I think the tubing was designed to carry molten gold and it was being pumped into a container. But what's keeping the gold molten? If there's something about the lagoon that keeps it molten, why would it stay molten after? Well, it's, it seemed like it was being pumped up into there from the lagoon. So I'm not quite sure what's keeping it molten down there without it being really freaking hot. Because even being in the same cavern with molten gold would probably make you feel like you're standing right next to a furnace. Mm -hmm. But I'm just saying, the gold around Goldie was solidified because we had that fake statue. But the rest of the gold was still molten. So why would that gold solidify and all the other gold stay molten? Because I'm pretty sure that gold was being pumped. It's still in its molten state from the cavern area into the boat. And the reason the gold from Goldie was solid is because she's been out of the cavern for a while, so it solidified. Also, it would be pretty easy now that I think about it to actually break out of a gold encasing like that. Because gold is very soft. So in case I'm missing anything, I'm pretty sure it's just the fact that it was being pumped in its molten state from down there into the ship. And that's why it was still molten that substance was still molten compared to what was surrounding Goldie. Fair enough. Also, Glomgold's completely fictitious flashback. <laughs> that was so awesome. It was even like done in kind of a comic style. Uh, and he's all like buff and everything. Glomgold is a character <laughs> in a TV show. Awesome character. Though I still like Launchpad better. Also, I'm starting to really overanalyze the intro now. Because it's getting, it's, getting, it's getting ridiculous in my head. Because I'm watching it now going, I think I'm seeing symbolism in this now. Because at the end, Launchpad saves everyone. Yeah, I see what you're doing there. But how many times have we watched it and I don't remember seeing Lena or Magica? I think it's because those two were also a surprise. But still, nobody watching the intro would have gotten Duckworth out of that ghost demon. Yeah, but I think he was actually... I think there's somewhere... No, it wasn't in the intro. It was something I caught in the preview we saw again. I'm not going to mention it because Amber can assemble things out of thin cloth. Like, oh, there's a small speculation. What do you mean you now have the entire season plot? It goes like this. Watch it. You had 95% of that right. 98. <laughs> oh, yeah. I forgot about that episode. Uh, speaking of episodes, should we... Mm -hmm. Okay, that was me making a hand motion of, shall we wrap things up with, what are your final thoughts on these two episodes? Really interesting, two very different episodes, because, okay, yeah, we kind of got distracted by the money shark, but Scrooge having to deal with a very real thing of public relations and his public image, also Beakley scolding him with a spray bottle. And him acting just like a cat. Though ducks swim. Also, forgot to mention, him cutting down the boots to make the spats. He's like, well, in that case, I'll take your best boots and your sharpest knife. Cut, 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 cut. There we go. When would that for the lady needs? What lady? Dang, nabbit! I love how he moments he sees her in the outfit. Twing! <laughs> I just love the chemistry between those two. Just, this show has so much going on in it. Both episodes were wonderful. I've got so many new things to think about. This stuff's going to come in important later. I just know it. 
Well, of course it is, because Goldie's off who knows where, and she's practically a female Scrooge McDuck. Except, I think just a tad bit cooler. Just something about her attitude is like, yeah, I like Scrooge, but she rocks. But traitor is backstabbing. Yeah, that, that's that's why it's like, dang it, dang it. Dang it. <laughs> but it's going to be important because she's going to be nowhere nearby. And somehow that medallion would allow Scrooge to find her. But will it allow any of the boys to find her? Because odds are that the only way Goldie's getting looked up is if there is trouble. And there's going to be trouble because of Magica and Lena. Hmm. Good point. So, shall we do our outro? Mm hmm And this has been our thoughts on Disney's DuckTale Reboot, episodes 14 and 15. Jaws, with a dollar sign, and the Golden Lagoon of White Agony Plains. Uh, um, the, the show's over. You can uh, go home now. Oh, you're already at home. That's right, digital streaming and all that. Um, so, since you're here, uh, there's some links. You know, there's more artwork, we have more videos, there's commissions, there's Patreon, there's coffee. You know what those are, right? You know, the, the things where you, you give money to people that you may or may not know because you like them or like what they do. And so commissions, you, you take that picture in your head and you describe it in excruciating detail or less excruciating and a picture comes back drawn by someone else. Who can draw things from your head. Oh, wait. No, 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 no. Stop thinking that enjoyed this i mean you're at the outro like i said before lots of other videos we have playlists we even have different source material check out ember's reading room currently broadcasting on wednesdays thank you so much for watching and listening we appreciate all of the support that we receive in the form of views likes comments dialogue suggestions and of course financially as well but all of it is truly appreciated Thank you to all of our supporters, subscribers, etc. in whatever form you choose to grace us with your presence.